Georgia Tech. Uh, he's going to talk about stem cell engineering. Uh, Todd is um, he's actually part of our uh, NSF Science and Technology Center and is the director of um, is it Stem Cell Institute. Stem Cell Engineering Center. And engineering Center at Georgia Tech. Um, and uh, has also um, started up a new course in stem cell engineering at Georgia Tech that uh, we also offer through this uh, uh, graduate teaching consortium that I think I've mentioned to you before that we run through our Science and Technology Center. Um, so Todd is, uh, has been uh, working with us in terms of understanding stem cell behavior, so it fits very nicely into the labs that you guys have been doing, both in the, myo the myocytes next week and the, the neuron differentiation this week. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to your lecture. Cool. Thanks, Roger. Is there a light you said for that one? Is there one? what? A li oh, uh, let me fix the lights for you. Okay. Let's go and it out. <coughs> Looks good. Oh, perfect. You want the board, board lights on? Or? Yeah, that's fine. I think okay. that'll be okay. Good. So, thank you. And uh, good morning. Um, Roger told me last night over dinner this is a very interactive group, and so I'm expecting questions or encouraging questions along the way. Um, I know we have time designated at the end for discussion, but I'm happy to use that up in, in the course of uh, uh, what I'm going to be presenting and discussing um, so that we can have this as more of a conversational kind of feel. Um, and Roger also asked that you know this not just be our kind of standard research, uh, this is what my lab does. Um, so what I'm going to try and do with that is I have interspersed with this one of the other activities over the past year that um, I was fortunate to be a part of was a, a study on stem cell engineering. And so as Roger said, I've got this interest in this obviously, my research is based around that, the center uh, teaching a course in it, but this, this uh, study that we did which included trips to both Asia as well as Europe and visiting multiple sites, working with uh, uh, to me the leaders in the field including Peter Zanstra, Sean Polachek, Dave Schaefer, Gene Loring, with the other members on this panel, um, it really helped give us a sense of what's going on in the field. And so as we're summarizing this, we're in the process of, of finishing up uh, this study, we're writing chapters and summaries, and so what I have interspersed with this is actually from a workshop that we gave to, as the preliminary sort of findings from that at NSF, where there was multiple uh, agencies, or representatives from multiple agencies, including NIH and NIST and DOD, uh, even FDA, uh, is give you a sense then of what is, um, what we kind of thought and what we kind of found from these, these uh, our visits, our discussions, our own personal uh, uh, perspectives on the field. So I say that also because what you'll see is that the format of my slides, some of the ones are formatted for those presentations, so you'll know when they came from that, and then you'll see the ones that are coming from my research or my own kind of you know, perspective on these when you see the different backgrounds. So I've got a mix and match, but that's intentional in this case. So let me start with this, and this is an intro slide that I've used many times and I think can still, still fits pretty well for where, where I want to go, and that is, to make the case about stem cell engineering, and, and you, this is a term that, that is not necessarily new, but you know, many times the discussion of is this a new field or not, part of the study was is this a new emerging field in and of itself, or is it just a, a theme that is interspersed across many fields? And, and I would use this to make at least some argument, uh, maybe not convincingly, but some argument that I think it is emerging as its own field. So going back you know, 20 or so or more years to tissue engineering, which is now recognized as its own sort of entity, that started at the intersection of multiple fields. Um, and I would say stem cell engineering has currently or presently been at that point, and as pe more people have been uh, engaged and invested in it, we see that this is taking on its own identity, so, so why? What's going on? So my perspective is that there's been a tremendous amount of knowledge acquisition and basic scientific discovery in stem cell biology over the past particularly the last decade, 10 to 15 years, um, but dating back you know, over the last half century. And what that has enabled us to do is to, to really understand what are the different types of stem cells, how can they be obtained, the characterization necessary to distinguish between different types of stem cells, not just how they look, but how they function. And another interesting thing that came about from all of that is if you know all of the sorts of bits and pieces, and I'll extrapolate a little bit on this, then you can just make stem cells. And I realize that that's not exactly you know, the way, but in some ways it is. There's now the ability to take a cell that would not be deemed a stem cell by any of the, the current metrics in the field, and in a matter of less than a couple of weeks, you have within a culture dish something that functionally, phenotypically, 
by and large, 95% or so, looks and acts, behaves like a stem cell. And, and I'm speaking generally here, I'm speaking about a specific type of stem cell, a pluripotent cell, which was sort of one of the most earlier primitive ones. But now this concept has been extended to other types of stem and progenitor cells as well. So there's a principle now, and you've probably heard about this reprogramming or induction of these various ones. So you'll see a bunch of cell lines that start with a little I, and then whatever it is behind it. So IPS was the first one, but I now see IN for neurons. I see ICM for cardiomyocytes. So it's really taken over and it's changed cell biology in that way that what we once thought that cells were sort of static entities and they can change over time, that this really uh, demonstrates that there's much more uh, flexibility, plasticity in the, in the inherently in cells and that they can revert across multiple uh, uh, lineages even, but it requires a significant stress on cells to do that. So what's come about from all of that is we have the raw materials. So much like when petroleum for, was first discovered, when semiconduct, uh, or the, uh, I should say, uh, silicon uh, was first discovered, the raw crude materials that go into the luxuries that we enjoy today all started at this similar type of point. And what it yielded over time was technologies, technologies that, that are, have major societal impact, and many of which I would say that you couldn't have expected at the time of the discovery. So when you look now at like the first transistor and how it was wired, the person working on that I don't think was envisioning all of the electronics that fill this room today. I don't think they sat down and said, well, if I do this, I will get this. It wasn't a linear sort of course of, of thinking. So as much as we can predict some of these right now, the ones that are missing or absent from this I think are also going to be the exciting ones we just simply don't know yet. So how do you go from here to there? So in all of the, again, looking historically at these other fields what's happened, it's when in engineering in particular, or engineers from various types of disciplines, start to get involved at this interface, to discussing with the scientists and biologists and, and others, that there starts to become this, this first understanding of the language, understanding the principles. Then there's the engineering expertise, I think, that can fit into this pipeline that really enables this sort of translation forward. And I think the other exciting part of it, for me at least, is that it's not all just take this information and go forward, there's feedback. And the feedback is that in these discussions and the rest of it, there's new things you find that for maybe an engineering type, that's not that hard to do, we think, or oh, we can do that. And then that feeds back into science and there's further enrichment of this. So this is the role that I would, I would say that I see stem cell engineering taking on right now, is that it can play this role sort of in between these and advance both sides of, of the biology as well as the applications. So, Let's, let's get into then what's going to be, how do you control these such, such things? So this is actually from a nice review for that from uh, and Peter's answer. Let me borrow this. So this is one of the slides he used during our, our workshop. This is from a very nice review he did with Dennis Disher and Dave Mooney discussing the various types of, of physical and chemical cues that, you know, even if you look at these two cell types, the stem cell and oftentimes the accompanying cell population, generically referred to as a niche cell, but there's various types of these. There's all kinds of interactions going on with the physical elements of this micro of this environment and overlaid on top of this you also have gradients of various things whether they be soluble chemicals or gases. So it's, it's extremely complex and all of this information has to somehow be synthesized by this, by a stem cell or even by the neighboring cells to know how to respond in some appropriate or maybe perhaps even inappropriate way. Um, and these uh, responses typically manifest themselves in terms of self-renewal or quiescence, on the other hand. And not all, not all stem cells, although they have a potential for self-renewal, sometimes the, the, the physiologically the important thing is that they're not doing that, uh, at least until they're called upon or required to amplify and be useful in some kind of uh, maybe wound healing situation. There's also this ability to differentiate, so can they turn into things besides themselves? This is oftentimes where the real utility of the cells is. Having stem cells is great, right? But if they don't do anything, <laughs> then it's sort of like having this reservoir of potency but never, never using it or never exploiting it for something. Um, and there's a lot of other things that along the way. Cells have to migrate and those sorts of things. So one of the things, I've, I'm just going back now to a slide and it's similar, and I, I often joke, all of us in this, we always have our own rendition of that slide I just showed you. I think the one that Peter and, and those guys did has, was nicer uh, uh, publication quality and had a little bit more information in it. But I, so instead of go through this, I want to focus on this. And the question about this is, I think we're really going at, is quantitatively understanding this and all of this complexity, can we break it down into if any phenotype is a function of all of these parameters? First of all, what are the parameters? So the list here keeps sort of growing. I've listed this as sort of historically where most people started. 
but mechanics is obviously one you probably heard about and talked about. It's one of the most more, more recent and one of interest, particularly to many engineers, about how this can be used as a way to control phenotype or even uh, uh, perhaps fine tune phenotype of the cells. But that means that perhaps also that we're not done with this list yet. And with anything, not all things are equally weighted. So I have a coefficient term sitting in front of these because in some contexts or scenarios, it could be that certain parameters are much more, have exert a much more dominant influence. And also, of course, there's dose dependence. All of these things happen over some function of time, so integrating under area under a curve can have an effect. Uh, and so this gets, as I said, very complex. And so this equation, this is about as best I can do. I can't take very, almost any scenario and start filling this in. But the idea is that can you take experimentally and probe these systems and figure out independently what some of these parameters are and also the interdependence because it's very difficult to make a change to any one of these without affecting something else in the in the system and so I'm going to focus on some examples from our own lab today where we've tried to do that and you try to go through systematically but oftentimes then you have to be careful or, or cognizant of the other things that are changing in the system over time so let me use another another slide from Peter's talk at this which was if you're starting from this stem cell state through perhaps some series of progenitors ultimately yielding some differentiated progeny. All of this again, function of time. So we didn't discuss this or coordinate these slides, but you'll see some themes that come out that are consistent. Well, then you've got things like receptor expression. So this is sort of the sensitivity of the cells to certain types of cues. So one receptor may not really be present and accumulates over time. It might go away over time as well. As whereas receptor two, so some other signal, over time perhaps as it differentiates, it's losing expression of that and the sensitivity to, to whatever that signal might be. So that would be simple if that's all there was, but it's not. So there's within the cell, for example, transcription factors. And depending upon how long these transcription factors are around, these are downstream of say the receptor ligand interactions. You might have a transcription factor with a relatively short half-life, and as whether this is responsible or it's downstream of this receptor decrease, you may see this decreasing, and you also see this transient nature of transcription factor one. So here you have a shift of at least two proteins, but these could be maybe very important proteins to these different cell states. And then you've got now responsiveness. So whether this responsiveness is to uh, a variety of different other things, it could be the hypoxic response, it could be some other things, this now is also changing. So at any single time as you're looking across this, there's this whole bar is changing. So you can think of if you had multiple traces, like you're at the you know, hospital room, it's just doing the, the one trace, but if you see the fancier ones, it's taking you know, uh, blood pressure and, and, and uh, heart rate and glucose monitoring, you've got all these things kind of going at once. And so you're trying to monitor, figure out what's going on, and all of that, you're saying then, well, what's, what's the, what's the uh, state of that patient or the state of that cell? So we, in the hospital, they have sort of things they can use this. We don't have this for stem cells, and you also don't wire or hook up stem cells currently like that. So let me then say, okay, as a broad introduction, those are, the, those are some of the problems. <laughs> um, we have a lot of information, a lot of interesting things. There's a lot of ways experimentally to probe it. So what are we, where do you get some instruction or cues about how to try and start to, to uh, uh, emulate or control such cells? And one that I, I often use or lean upon, and, and arguably it may not, it's not the only one. I would say that actually sometimes non-physiological stimuli, if they're well controlled, and then you have an actual, can yield new mechanistic understanding. So I, I actually personally favor that approach, but one you'll often hear about is how, does, how do primitive cell types gain, uh, acquire their specific cell fates? And in the context also, not just of differentiating, but I'll use the term morphogenesis because during development, we're not, uh, in this room, we're all, obviously not all planar species, right? If we were, that would just be sort of the differentiation. There's no shape change. You just grow infinitely across a substrate and you become a being. So unless it's like wrinkle in time kinds of things where you're flattened or compressed in some state, um, you know, we're not like that. We operate in a 3D sense. So this happens and starts very early on, even from simple sort of bilayer types of uh, uh, cell structures and it progresses through this sequence of events so that the shape changes accompany and actually this movement of the cells around one another is, uh, we'll hear I think some more about this from the next speaker, it's very instructive in terms of how uh, differentiation and development proceeds. So in one of these, I'll just say gastrulation is one. Gastrulation is the early, one of the early stages of development where you really see a major shift from uh, pluripotent or early specification of the cells to the three germ lineages, so ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Um, and if there's a deficiency in any single one of these, oftentimes it will lead to developmental catastrophe. 
it will arrest, and without the one, there's an interdependence of the various cell populations on one another. So if you eradicate one, the rest of it, this process just sort of ceases. So when Lewis Wolper, a famous developmental biologist, said that you know, it's the most important day of your life. So nothing against your, your birthday, your, your wedding, your you know, first child, but if you don't go through this, you don't get to experience the rest of those. Um, and the other thing then is just to focus on one system is that there's various ways, and you guys are working on these this week, I think, different ways to work in in vitro systems where we can start to probe this. And in vitro for this is particularly important because you can take some of these different stem cell types and, and uh, be able to interrogate them to more, a little more systematically. It's, it's, it's possible to do similar types of things sometimes in vivo, but maybe just slower. So a lot of the knowledge base has come from in vitro systems, but a lot of these, the different configurations the cells are placed in, whether it be an adherent monolayer or co-culture models or something in highlighted here is because I'm going to use one example that our lab is focused a lot on, which are these 3D cells, multicellular cell spheroids. Um, and each of these has sort of summarized here different types of uh, advantages or, uh, or disadvantages relative to one another. Um, I want to highlight two uh, that I'll go f through from just our, our examples. One of them is that, uh, you know, when you see challenges like this, it says difficult. I would say that up in, you know, to recently guided differentiation of one specific cell type has, been, has never, never really been reported. It was very difficult, uh, nearly impossible to do. Um, but then there's also the, the theoretically di difficult, and it gets a little bit easier. It's more possible. Um, but morphogenesis is really only uh, possible in this kind of context. And this gets back to what I said about the kind of planar nature of this. You have to allow cells for that 3D space and configuration to move about to, to acquire something that looks like or is very primitive in terms of tissue-like structures. Uh, my background coming from tissue engineering, one of the things that got me interested in stem cells was we can make very unique and, and moving from 2D to 3D kind of configurations. There's been a lot of advances, but oftentimes the most limiting factor is the source of the cells. And that's what got me interested in stem cells in the first place to say, well, yeah, then I'll just, you know, the, the cartoon example is very clear. I go to a stem cell source, I make my cells, and now I can go back and do whatever tissue engineering thing I want to do. Um, I, I think, like many learned, that's not, not that simple. The, the cartoon you see doesn't work that way. It's a lot, lot harder than that. So it got me interested then in thinking about well, what if we apply it very early and what are the possibilities from this? And that's what also kind of gave us a focus on this, although there's other elements, my lab, many others do. And so there's a lot of work in these, and I could kind of try to summarize all of them. I'll try to use some of the principles and examples just in this kind of context and basis. So one thing about the embryoid body model is that this name uh, has been given to this, is that it does, it has similar uh, recapitulates aspects of early stages of, of embryonic development. And that is that you have basically this population of cells, relatively homogeneous, they form a 3D ball or aggregate. This happens through a cell self-assembled mediated, uh, so ecadherin, the cells can cluster to one another. So if you provide them with low adhesive substrate, they will want to aggregate, it favors aggregation. And then over time and under certain culture conditions, these things, oftentimes the, the term is given spontaneously. I don't know that it's purely spontaneous in the sense it's just random as can be, but what it does do, and it's, it's a non-predictable sort of ratio or, or stimulation uh, of ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm derivatives. And then oftentimes changes to cultures, environments, or systems is used to try and favor one or more of these at the expense of the other. Um, in development, the one contrast is that you can get a similar sequence of these of the gene expression changes. So when you do microarrays on something like this and this, you see a whole bunch. You can see a whole bunch of similarities, oftentimes, but you don't see the types of structures, the patterns, the spatial fidelity that development has. So it also is, as some cue uh, to this says, you know, I don't. Uh, my lab, we're not trying to make embryos in a dish. I'll show you an example where we sort of ended up in a place that had an example which was interesting, but that wasn't the intended outcome of it. And also, we don't have the tools to make that thing mature like a mouse would. So you see a phenotype that can emerge. But what we'd be interested in is what are these local types of things? So you, could you emulate so that the whole sphere of cells behaves like either one side or the other or another region of this type of embryonic-like structure? Now you're on a path you might be able to start thinking about engineering a tissue of at least that lineage. And that's sort of you know ours and many other people's interest in this. But I'll also point out, because I'm going to talk about this, you know, I mean, many times in engineering, we want to try and control all these different elements of this. And one of the beautiful things to me about this process is that the cells themselves have such an ability to direct themselves. It's just, as I said, not so well controlled oftentimes. So many times it's interesting to us to think about and really try to understand this. So there's a real science-y side and this emergent behavior of these integrated cellular systems that is, uh, I think, 
very intriguing and has a potential for a completely new type of engineering. And that's one of the things that the center has really en engaged in me and really brought out that I didn't even realize was sort of within our own research at the time. Um, so one of the things with this, just to give you a snapshot of it, uh, again, this heterogeneity that exists in the system. If you start with the undifferentiated cell population here in 2D, then moving them to suspension culture, taking them out over time, they can start off, and we've developed many ways, I'll show you a couple, where we can make this more homogeneous, so control the, the population at least, how they look, and then you can see that initially they're fairly homogeneous with how the cells are, appear morphologically, but this quickly changes, and you oftentimes will see this sort of uh, hemispherical or divergent behavior. The cells on this side, we could even speculatively say, and then we can confirm this using molecular techniques, are not adapt, uh, adopting the same cell fate as the ones on the other side. And so, one, I think it says, okay, well, you can't, you know, the, the heterogeneity part, which I mentioned, but the other is, is this, uh, is this the result because when one side starts to differentiate, the other one is going to go another way because of crosstalk? And I actually think that over time, the more that I've appreciated, I don't know that we can get away from heterogeneity. I think it's going to happen in this system, but if we can understand how it's happening and control for it, then we can start to think about more, you know, uh, uh, reproducible, robust kinds of outcomes. Um, what you can see though, is if you look for any particular cell phenotype, and here it's just shown with sort of a panel of different markers for different, uh, uh, more differentiated cell types, that these don't appear to be what I would call stochastic or random events. If they were, it would be like the flashing light. One's here, one's there. No prediction of where it would be. In each of these kinds of examples here, and again, I could keep showing you others, I think, for this, there's always sort of a pattern involved. So here you've got an epithelial marker, and look, you've got something that looks sort of epithelial-like. It's aligned and it's lining some structure. What it's aligning, I don't know by this particular marker, but maybe it's surrounding one of these other cell types, if you, depending if you use different co-stating approaches. Um, and then you've got these clusters of cells, suggesting again that there was sort of something that could have been, there was either a clonal expansion of a single cell, although we know if we back calculate, rough, you know, back of the envelope things, that for the cell numbers you're getting in this, it's, it's probably not clonal expansion, that it's probably local neighborhoods of cells that are, uh, being subjected or exposed to a similar series of local cues, and that's what specifies this sort of local patterning event. But it's not very large throughout. Maybe it was just like even a portion of one of these regions. So, but that would be discouraging to say, oh, well, it's not gonna, you know, there's not much you can do about it. You know, this is, this is just always what's gonna happen. You can accept it and move on. Um, I would say that when you see things like that as engineers, you know, you, the, and in biology even in, in this, you know, the, the entry point is not when things are working really well. It's really hard to have impact and changes when something is at its 90% of the goal. A good part to enter in, I said, if this is difficult, or some people call it impossible or challenging, it's a great way to get in because the expectations are a lot lower. <laughs> if you can just make some progress, <laughs> you can have a statement about it. And so I'll show you one where actually, and this is, I would say, this wasn't a minimal, uh, uh, a minor impact kind of thing. This was a big jump, and this took years for this kind of group, for this group to do. But one of the things is that here in this starting basis of embryoid body, mouse embryonic stem cells, similar to what I just started to show you, and I should mention, everything I'll show you today is with mouse embryonic stem cells, it's the primary system, we've been a workhorse for us, but a lot of the things and, and techniques approach I'll show you can be done with other cell types, other uh, human induced or embryonic. So although I'm not showing some of the slides on that, it's still uh, unpublished of some of the work. A lot, everything is analogous. I can tell you that uh, from what I've seen in, in papers, and even this, this example that I'm showing here of where they get an optic cup to form through a series of events. This came out uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago in Nature with mouse. They've already published now with human, and this was in cell stem cell in the last month. So similar types of approaches. Not everything's exactly the same, and we shouldn't expect it to be, would be my, my uh, uh, response. But it does, um, it does show that you can develop principles and apply these, some of the general ones across systems. Um, this is an N of one experiment. So when you have an N of one experiment, great. But it's a little bit more convincing when an approach works, when you can show that it's, it happens again. And not just from the mouse to the human, but in this case now a different target or different uh, tissue type, uh, pituitary gland, a primitive one. And they can get this to happen again in these. And, and what I would show is that they're getting multiple of these structures to form uh, in these aggregates. So it's not just one every time, some random. In this population with this genetic marker, it's every single one of these this is happening in. And so well-controlled processes, well-controlled systems, you can get something to emerge and come out of it, even though they're just changing media, fixing the size. Uh, I don't believe they were manipulating with uh, 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 oxygen tension in these particular studies. But well-controlled, defined, and reproducible experiments can yield something very interesting like this. So. 
just as a, a, another kind of point of things to think about, in this size range, there's some interesting things. Um, you're talking about kind of functional modular units of about something on the order of hundreds to maybe several thousand cells. Um, so at this size scale, actually oxygen transport is not as much of a limitation when you think about macro tissue engineering. Now I'm globally saying that, you can still get a gradient that forms across these structures, but it may not be as large of a gradient and it might not have the limitations where, let's say you're trying to perfuse systems and stuff like that, that is necessary when you think about trying to make a whole organ all at once. So there's possibilities you could work with these and these could be your Legos or building blocks and you can make, use a bunch of these and then think about how you might be able to assemble them later. You'd still need a vasculature at that point or something if you're going in vivo, but there's ways to approach that that Michael Sefton and other leaders in the field have already started working on. Um, this is all cell mediated. There's no materials initially in this system. And uh, that might be sacrilegious to some when it uh, just came from meeting a heavy biomaterials component, but it means that you know, we don't always need materials to have all of the instructive cues, but when you do have materials-based approaches, I'll show you examples, you can start to fine tune elements of the system. So integrating them back in at different levels or different ways can be, uh, um, provide you additional levels of control. But it's not necessary uh, in this system. It's completely cells. Um, and also then at this size range and the fact that these are suspension culture, there are some practical considerations. So manufacturing, stem cell manufacturing uh, is one of these if you want to make stuff out of these. You can actually do this in, in bioprocessing sense in scalable way in suspension culture systems. So that's a, a, an inherent advantage as well. Um, and one other one is at the end of all of this, if you had a suspension of these, this is, it's already been shown by others, that if you use aggregate-based approaches, acute cell survival in, in transplantation scenarios into different tissues, it's enhanced over the short term. Now, uh, many times there's uh, uh, a lot of other sort of cytotoxic stuff going on that can, be adver can adversely affect the cells, but at least from in terms of initial injectable delivery where oftentimes single cell suspensions, the cells die within 24 hours, oftentimes more than 90% of the cells. So if you spent all your time making the product and you want to test this thing out and you inject it and then it's gone, you're not really, you spend all your time you know, on uh, fine tuning it and then you have nothing. So it's a minor, very minor change or consideration and it could have some of a short term effect. But at this point it's probably short term at least until we can get a little bit farther in terms of cell survival or cell, uh, tissue transplantation. So I just want to go through then, you know, a couple of the themes to this. Can you make tissues from this? I've shown you some snippets of examples and I can say it's a theme and how we're working towards that. If so, what are sort of the strategies? I'm going to show you a couple different ones in terms of sort of a global level and local level and how these can be in integrated. And then how do you implement this? I, I won't go into this detail. I just mentioned about bioprocessing. It's another sort of thematic interest. Um, but this one I do want to highlight because I think it's important. And again, I've cited emergent behaviors as one of these, not just because Roger is here and we're part of this grant. This is in all of my talks with this now. And it really has to do with if we think about our systems and really uh, uh, use the right sensing one, listen to or really be observant to what they are telling us, you can start to come up with new strategies. And I'll show you at least one example of that where our appreciation, when we realize we're doing all this characterization, and then we lift our head up for a second and say, wait, why are we doing all that? There's, there's a maybe simpler way to do this. And it was because of what the, the cell system was telling us. So just point of reference, give you a sense of how these ideas, at least in, in my mind, are sort of uh, merged. Our lab focuses a lot on this. We've worked with these multicellular aggregates or developed a lot of things for that. It's not everything we do, but it's, it's been a lot of the, it's been a, a major theme looking at differentiation of various cell types, and therefore we have interests in oftentimes different pathways. So the idea is that if, you, if we are working on something that is very pro-ectoderm, can we look at applications that might be more appropriate for that in the neural arena? Uh, mesoderm is one that we've focused a lot on, as it just turns out, because of some of the signaling pathways, molecules, and other things we've looked at. And so around this is sort of how do we engineer the environment the bioprocessing analytics, so not destro destroying ours and still being able to assay. And then the molecular therapy is part of this as well, where we actually are interested in what the cells produce as a potential molecular therapy in an acellular approach. Uh, and we've done this with mesenchymal stem cells as well, so varying levels of potency. Um, and so multipotent, unipotent, as well as our pluripotent. So I'll show you some examples from this and I'll cruise through a couple of these quickly so that we can get to discussion stuff. So if I skip one or two, just because I'm seeing time, don't worry about it, we can come back to it later. Um, so one thing I, and I've used and modified that slide slightly about, you know, give you a sense of how, which way to go on these, is sort of outside in, inside out. This is a newer slide I created to use this week. 
but it's actually something that talks about, you know, you have the multiple aggregates in a system and, and things you could do to control how they're perhaps differentiating. And then there's also the level of individual aggregates, things you can perhaps work from the inside out of individual units. And so let me give you a couple examples of both of these. But the problem, one problem again in this is that the instant you change one of these, you change the others. Um, one of the things in this in the physical systems, uh, sorry, this is now back from the, the other ones to highlight these challenges, is that there's all kinds of other things that are changing within the system. I said this is from uh, some of the Dave, Dave Schaefer's intro about modulus shear, transport, topography, things that are changing as you make these perturbations to the system. And these are more physical sorts of changes. So even if you're uh, using the same chemistries, these kinds of changes can have an effect. Um, and one of the things that's important to point out, you know, the molecules oftentimes, you get the uh, comment, they'll do a mechanistic study, it means knock it out, that means rescue it, put it back in. You can't do that with physical changes quite the same way. It's a little bit more difficult because they're not genetically encoded uh, types of events. Um, and they, for, therefore, they can be challenging to vary, particularly in vivo, but in vitro, at least, with development of systems, you can start to, to get at some of these mechanisms. Um, and so the opportunities here is that, you know, there's a big role where physical sciences and engineering, so the mechanics part of this being one of them, and various other forms of, I think, physical types of cues can play a role. Um, and then the, the big thing is, you know, if you have technologies for this, so you guys are working with microfluidic devices this week where you can actually now use those, that's not, you know, what a, a cell in an in vivo one typically sees, but you can recreate elements of, the, of what it may be exposed to in a much more controlled and defined way. And that's where these technologies become important. Um, and then apply this then to new types of, of technology. So sensors, separations, that kind of thing. So a couple years ago, this is one example I'll start off with, with where you looked at these where if we put our culture dishes on a rot rotating orbital shaker at the time of the initial formation, then we got a difference in the formation of, this, of the population. So we got a more uniform looking population and we quantified this by a number of metrics. Compared to this static one, where basically if you put single cell suspension in, it's just uncontrolled. They first aggregate, and then they, the term we use is agglomerate to distinguish between the two events. You have an aggregate of cells, and now they just keep merging. And if this keeps happening over time, the system is constantly changing, right? There's never one functional unit. It's always then merging, and then the cells are exposed to another population. Um, it's, if you were trying to develop, right, and uh, it would be like conjoined twins, but over and over again, you know, and, and so what you would get would be totally unpredictable, it's what you bounce into, but you know, in many cases we don't develop that way. You know, you develop sort of upright in your own sense and then you look at the diversity across a population that way. Um, so this is one very simple way to think about how you might do that. The hanging drop is another approach, but very low throughput, very tedious in a technical sense, but works very well. So that was interesting and practically useful. What was also interesting was that this actually manifested itself in this first case, it was something we could see visually. So if we plate the individual embryo bodies out in wells and just count the frequency with which we see this spontaneous contractile activity, this is indicative of cardiomyogenesis, we could actually find that the rotary was sort of in between the two extremes. Hanging drop yields this at a relatively high percentage, oftentimes almost every single hanging drop of a certain size and culture conditions will yield this, whereas the static ones, it, it's not as many per the number of aggregates. Rotary was in between, just like, and was weird here, you know, sort of in between the, the physical appearance and it was behaving like something in between. Um, and it actually turned out that there were more cardiomyocytes as well. It wasn't just the frequency of the event, it actually was due to the fact that there were more cardiomyocytes, similar number, slightly greater actually even than in the hanging drop. And going further with this, then the, the graduate student, uh, Carolyn Sargent, then said, well, this is only one rotary orbital speed, now I can start to, you know, change these over time. Um, she did these all with continuous throughout her culture periods, but we had also done a series of pilot studies and th started to think about it and kind of backed off because you could be switching your speeds every day, you can be going faster, slower, all kinds of almost infinite regimens to see what would happen. And we thought that that wouldn't be the most effective strategy. Let's try to develop and see what the principles would be. And she did find that there were big different, the biggest differences were between static and rotary environments with regards to here using like gene expression profiling and then other so cytometry tools. But what was interesting was that um, even within these, these distinct groups, there were still subtle changes that occurred. So their big jump was static to rotary. So there's a large coefficient perhaps there, smaller coefficient with regards to what the rotary orbital speed was. So this gave us a couple of questions, and I'll use this as maybe a primary example to go through some of these more in depth, is, you know, what, why would this occur? So a physical change has to be transduced somehow by the cells. Um, a couple of the ways that's possible is that there's endogenous signaling pathways that could be changing, the kinetics or the magnitudes, or both. 
Um, and also, one thing that, uh, that we said we're interested in is what stem cells are producing or what they're expressing. And so, oftentimes, you know, we try to introduce things that we think are morphogenic agents. But as we started to appreciate one of these things early on was that the cells are making some of these themselves. If you change their environment or some aspect of their environment, are you shifting what they express? And is that then catalyzing a feedback, which we still don't totally understand that whole feedback loop, but could you be changing the, the, the setting such that they are um, expressing more or less of certain molecules, which could then make them more prone to differentiate one particular way or another? Um, we also, there was a caveat in that system. I'll just show how we started to address that. So this is an example of how do you refine what you're doing uh, over time. And in this case, you know, we ha saw differences in the size. Size is a physical change to, this, to these aggregates. And that has already been published by several others in the field that that alone can have an effect because you've changed the relative ratio per unit. Um, and this last one is, is can we then sense physical changes coming out of this? And I'll, I'll give one example, although the speaker behind me is gonna give you better examples in my opinion. <laughs> So the first one of these, let me just show you, is with beta-catenin signaling. This is an important pathway that's involved in the transition from the pluripotent phenotype to differentiation. So differentiation to a variety of lineages, but differentiation. And it's important is that beta-catenin can, can be found or sequestered at various points within the cell. In the cytoplasm, it's typically part of this GSK3 complex, where in a, in a phosphorylated form, so it, uh, it is actually bound to GSK3 and prevented from degradation. If it becomes dephosphorylated, then it actually is, can be uh, uh, separated from this and oftentimes it's degraded or it actually can be transduced into the nucleus. Um, sorry, I had that back, when it's complex, it can, it can be, go down the pathway for degradation, sorry. When it's, it's dephosphorylated, this is one of the things, usually phosphorylation is the signal active form. Beta-catenin is the opposite for that. Um, and so dephosphorylated can actually be trans, uh, uh, translocated to the nucleus and then you get activation binding to the TCF left promoter and then boom, things, things start to happen. It can also be found though sequestered with e here at the cell membrane. And it's still very, not very well known what's going on here. When, you know, there's signaling known, but why, why a transcription factor bound here can be found so many places in the role, it's, it's still complex, that's a field in and of itself. But it's important in this context, we just chose to look at this and whether these changes may be having an effect on it, in particular because the aggregation kinetics are changing. So e cadherin and how much e cadherin is perhaps, uh, how many e cadherin interactions you have in these clusters is one of the things that's changing when you change the rotary orbital speed. And when we looked for just the endogenous patterns of beta catenin, we saw differences. I won't go through these. It's kind of a hard thing to kind of quantify, but you see differences in patterns. The green here is that dephosphorylated, and so we f see visually a little more of it, but we see it in dis different locations more of it seems to be overlaid with nucleus. Whereas over time, it starts to see, appear to be more sequestered to the membrane of the cells. This could be e here and it could also be notch. There's a recent paper about the fact that it can couple to the cytoplasmic portion of notch receptors. Um, but it, we see that that expression is in some populations and not in others. So this says, say, suggestive, only suggestive at this point, that there were changes in what's going on with the beta catenin and where it's present in the cells. And the fact that it's a transcription factor would suggest maybe there's changes with its activity. To look at that, what we had to do was actually use a lentiviral reporter construct. So we transduce the cells, make stable clones, then make sure that they're still behaving like ES cells and make sure that they're responsive because the dynamic range of these sometimes is, could be limiting. Pick very responsive clones as well. Um, and so by adding in uh, lithium chloride or other agents that can decouple the beta catenin, you could, we could get clones that were very positive for OCT4, the pluripotent marker, as well as responsive, and in this case you see luciferase activity. Um, if we rerun the uh, experiment then with these cells, so same conditions, now we just have a, a, a genetically manipulated cell line, what we see is that actually here they look similar in terms of the morphology, these relative size changes, but then we can start to take these populations, perform the, uh, and then uh, add the substrate, look at the luminometer, and basically measure the activity. And what we see is that actually in this transient period, shortly after aggregation, you see increases in the, uh, in the rotary populations, more so in 25 than the others, than the static. And then it all sort of dies off over time. So this is one of those as an example. If we had just done, you know, we could just publish and say, oh, well, just time, uh, day three, right? But you say, well, why'd you pick day three? And so we looked at all of them, <laughs> and the changes are not there. The changes are transient over time in a lot of these systems. There's dynamics to it. And so that's why, again, going back to that thing about the equation, you need the delta T term in there as well if you really want to understand what's going on. 
Um, and I, I'll go over this, but you can look at gene expression downstream responses and other types of things. And all I will say is that it's, it's, a, it's a mess in some ways, trying to, to take one clear story out of this. But you see changes in uh, what I would consider feedback elements of this. So the physical change is actually affecting TCF left expression, which then can go on and actually affect canon canonical and non canonical wince, which feed back, back on that same pathway. So the, the traditional one is, you know, you talk about beta it says Wnt beta catenin pathway. In this case, we were trying to look at the physical changes, but it's unavoidable that the Wnt is embedded in this unless somehow we knock all that out as well. And that's not really possible to do in this kind of scenario. The natural inhibitor, DKK1, is actually also showing sort of a cyclic behavior, and we see increases in the rotary populations relative to static. So this is a further indication that you're manipulating a pathway, and now it's trying to perhaps re-regulate itself. And the change we've made physically is also being sort of uh, dealt with by the cells in perhaps in this way. This is just gene expression though, we have to look at protein or things to really confirm that, but it was very intriguing that by making the change we're affecting that pathway that is so important to this whole process. Um, the other thing that we've, we've done, I mentioned is you know, what else is changing? Well, that's just a, say wince are just a couple of the molecules. If you look more broadly at other growth factors and matrix over the course of differentiation, in this case just using rotary orbital, just sort of uh, uh, descripti describing this over time, then what we can see is that actually there are changes in a bunch of different genes and there's different patterns that some are associated with one another. Um, so this is over the first two weeks. And then the other thing we use is that, you, you know, you can then take this whole array, run them all and look at individual genes. That may tell you something, but it's really can you do more integrative type of analysis. So I'll show you a couple examples then where we use basically clustering algorithms and other software types of tools to try and dissect this uh, uh, molecular complexity. So here's an example of that. This is called k-means clustering. And here again, we've taken all those individual time points, compressed them, so you're seeing the average of the data set I just showed you. And we've taken both of the two independent arrays and put them together. And then we, when we run this analysis, what you can see is that there are certain groups of genes that relative to where they start, the undifferentiated cells, they decrease and they stay decreased over this course. And if you go back in and look at the identities of these, this, many of these are already known, or, or almost perhaps all of these were known to be pluripotent associated. So they're growth factors that are expressed by the undifferentiated cells that oftentimes help with the self renewal, and they decrease, but we're trying to promote differentiation, so you would expect that. There are other ones that decrease and come back up, so it suggests that again, the same molecule can play different roles, perhaps, at different stages of differentiation. That's not a new concept in biology. There's oftentimes a lot of functional redundancy when something is used in one context and in another, for different uh, phenotypic sort of needs of the cell, I guess. And then there's a bunch of others. And in this case, again, these were, as I said, largely a lot of matrix and growth factors that are associated and known to be. So a lot of these that are in here that the cells are expressing themselves are the same ones that when you read a lot of the literature that, you add, that people are adding in. So they're adding things in exogenously. And I know they're not listed because there's too many here. So I'm, I'm not masking it in the paper, <laughs> which was just accepted, all the identities. So there's no uh, protein A, protein B. There are, there are names associated with each of these. Um, but in each of these, this is the thing. And this is what got us thinking a lot about this. We're always adding these factors in, trying to control it. But we're not necessarily measuring the baseline of what the cells are expressing. And again, this is just the gene expression. We look at that in the, with the protein to confirm the actual amounts that are present in this culture systems. Um, there we go. And one of the things, too, is that there's different ways. And you can come up and create. This is one that we sort of had to, uh, or not sort of had to, we sort of created based on things. And this is a statistical tree mapping of this. So at each of the time points between the undifferentiated and the differentiated, what we looked at was the significant changes. So in, in analysis like this, oftentimes, it's sort of a, a representation of everything. And you can choose what to filter and what to put into the different subsequent algorithm and clustering. In this case, we said, no, we're only gonna look at significance and significance of uh, well, 0 0.05, but ANOVA, using ANOVA analysis across the time points for all of these. And again, you can change your, your, uh, your stringency for that. But one of the things that struck us was that the biggest change, if you look at the relative numbers of these, is that only three genes change significantly, increase. So not everything, to get something to start means you don't have to flip a switch on. More, off, more cells that were changing over time, you had to turn switches off. And this was similar to, you know, it wasn't totally new from the other analysis I showed you, but this is presenting that ratio of the two. Um, again, all of these were largely, and some of the genes, again, it's a little small in this view, are pluripotent associated. So you have to turn off the things that are keeping them in that state, is what this suggests, before you can start to get differentiation to proceed. 
And then over time, there's sort of a period then where there wasn't a lot of changes. Again, the first two, there's third of things are static. Even the ones that changed initially, there weren't subsequent changes in them. There's sort of a period, and again, this doesn't have the other sort of cellular events, whether there's proliferation and stuff like that included. But now you start to see that there's increases in a lot of other things. And these are the ones that are associated. And the only thing from this we can't tell is what is causal and correlative. So if the cells have differentiated, does that mean that's why they're changing what they express? Or are there things that start to be expressed that then further kind of uh, stimulate the differentiation and maturation of cells? And I would say the answer is both from what we can take away. So that means that, you know, and there's what we've also shown is if you change the rotary, you change your dials, rotary and, and uh, uh, different speeds or static to rotary, you can change all of that I just showed you. <laughs> not, not that the whole thing changes, the global system looks similar, but there are differences in certain genes. And that could again be why we see certain different phenotypes or patterns emerge. Um, one of the things more recently Melissa Kay did to refine this is the initial formation. And so she's used this uh, microwell approach, which is a very simple technique that Peter Zanstra's lab de uh, developed. Uh, it's been commercialized, so very quick or rapid translation from the lab and findings to a commercial or, or to a uh, reagent. So this is an example where understanding the engineering, it's fed right back in. This is now becoming one of the most rapid, uh, rapidly adopted tools. If you're doing any kind of aggregate kind of biology, I see more and more uh, labs using this. Um, so Melissa you know, demonstrated she could do this, control the relative populations. Um, and if she puts these back into this, this rotary orbital system, then what you see is that at slow speeds, they agglomerate. So you can't keep, you can start with well-defined size, but it will lose it over time. But if you maintain it at specific uh, size populations, then what happens over time is that you can keep them separate. So now we keep all of our entities individual, no conjoined twin kind of things here, but we keep these separate. We can look then, did hydrodynamics really have an effect when other factors and parameters were held constant. And she looked at this by sizes didn't change and the numbers didn't change, so that just confirmed that so the lack of significance here indicates there was nothing that differed significantly between them. How many cells are inside each embryo? In each one. So, sorry, I went back one. So in this case, we varied it between 500 cells per aggregate and 2,000, but that's only part of the range. It starts oftentimes as low as, we've done this with 100 cells, um, if you go below that, it's just it's oftentimes hard to see them, or sometimes with this particular geometry, they may not aggregate well. But there's differences. You can do other things to try and force them to aggregate even more. But we're talking something on the hundreds to start with. And over the time they grow, it gets it's less than 10,000 typically per aggregate, but it'll be several thousand on the average, about four to six somewhere in there. So let me just show the. So now you run a similar gene expression array on these, and the only the major difference when you do the clustering is the time points. So at the early versus the late. And again, the individual uh, ones that you see across any single gene, you may see a couple of differences, but the overall signatures are similar. Okay, so this suggested to us that what we thought maybe hydrodynamics, what relative role it plays, I would suggest that now if you take aggregation into account, that it plays less of a role. So the coefficient for this term in this context is less than what we might have thought before. And what what was also interesting is that, you know, and, and uh, I think Melissa was, uh, you know, of course, many you always, publications are things that are often yielded by the differences. <laughs> so this made this a, a challenging paper, but I will say that a challenge presented to a very good student like Melissa, they, they can run with it. And she really turned this into a very nice story. And so she looked then and dissected at the time points and the genes and the rest of it, what's going on. You see similarly, so gray here means that both the 45 population, the 65 RPM population, you see similar decreases in the pluripotent factors, which is maybe what we'd expect. You see similar increases in several um, differentiate, or, uh, uh, differentiated markers, but there is some divergence that's occurring. And it's this divergence that is something that might be interesting that again, you have a, a, a fine tune adjustment in your system. It's, you have your, your coarse knob, right, when you zoom in and out, and you have your fine tuning knob. This would suggest that perhaps there's a way to fine tune that certain speeds, in this case some of the higher ones, may be pushing the cells towards one phenotype relative to some other cells at a slightly slower. And again, this is largely just based on gene expression, so you have to go through and to confirm that, and she did. I won't go through this one for sake of time, but if you look at the relative ratio of at least uh, an endoderm, with an endoderm marker of some of the cells, and you do flow cy quantitative flow cytometry, you actually see that there is a significant difference, small, this isn't tenfold, this is like a few percent, it was on the order of less than 10%, where you see a difference in the, in the uh, relative percentage of these two cell populations. And this is also, again, a function over time. So you may see more ad adoption of the, the phenotype early or later 
because one of the things that the later is you have other cell types that can emerge as well. So it can dilute out the one you're looking at. Um, and so she, she, this was sort of the, 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 fi the final findings of this. So again, it can have some effect is what we would, we would argue, or we did argue. <laughs> um, one of the other things, that was all in serum containing media. So that, that's a noisier background. It's hard to know what's in there. She's now started to repeat these, and I'll show this as another example, where when you start using defined media, serum-free defined media, adding in uh, uh, specific growth factors, BMP4 is one that you know, we, we see a lot of it being expressed by the cells, but it's also one of the most common ones studied, particularly for mesenderm differentiation. And she went through and characterized, again, similarly, the phenotypic changes in these systems. She even did some, uh, she, made, she looked at uh, the differences now with the treatment in terms of the numbers of cells. So there's some differences in the relative numbers of cells that you're getting in each population. And even uh, parameters like the volume are changing, small numbers of changes in the volume. Uh, and other appearances that she can look at in the aggregate itself. She does gene expression analysis, again, as you might, yep. So are the gene expressions kind of average between all the cells in, in the embryo? Yes, uh, and across multiple ones of those aggregates, yeah. So how do you look at different locations in that body, surface compared to the center or something? So we do a lot of that by immunocytochemistry and those types of approaches. We have not done, but we've been, I've been pushing, I want someone to do it. I want them to do in situ hybridization and look for mRNA signal and how that changes locally. Um, in situ, as you, you may know, it's a developmental biologists use it all the time. That's their, their, their workhorse for a lot of the systems because oftentimes they don't have as many antibodies available. This is the mouse system, there's a lot in human ones as well. Um, but we, we have not yet, and that's the appropriate way to do that or laser capture or some other things. If Do you think those differences are more because of, I don't know, sheer stress, some mechanical stimuli, or more the transport, the better transport? The <laughs> answer again, I would say is both. <laughs> I think that there is a, there is a uh, small, we've done the computational, or we worked with a collaborator who had a computational fluid dynamic model of this particular system. <coughs> because it's different than others where the system is orbiting and so the internal uh, fluid dynamics is because of an external agitation as opposed to an impeller type of sort of system. Um, and so we can know from that we can extract the estimates of the shear forces that the aggregates are exposed to in those regions. And it's on the order of about a half a dyne to, up to upwards of 2.5 dynes per square centimeter. But you're right, that would be the cells on the outside that would be experiencing that. So that's only one component and it varies as a frequency of time. It's not a constant. So the way it's a wave sort of function as it goes around, they kind of get bathed in it over and over again. So there's a frequency term and a magnitude term. <laughs> and as you change the, the speeds, there's an offset term. <laughs> so, or, or sorry, the frequency with it, but there's an offset in the population as well as what they're being exposed to. So it's not the best system as we've, so for these and so, we use it to keep things separate under co constant conditions a lot of time, but the difference between the two, we appreciated this is not an ideal system to extract each and every single one of those, those properties you just, you just mentioned. And transport is another one. Transport is a big one. So one of the things that you can't see at this resolution of these is that there's actually changes even to the outside structure of these that the, at the surface, there's a more porousy looking structure that they adopt under BMP4 treatment, serum free, than what we had seen in the, our earlier types of ones. So there's a shell-like formation that can occur. There are the serum containing and our other ex experiments leading up to this, and we don't see as much of that. We don't really see that appearance with the BMP4 treatment. So really change and control the soluble or, uh, milieu, and what you get is it now a difference in structure, which now can also change the transport. So we're very interested in these transport questions with the 3D. That's one of the big uh, driving force for a lot of our experiments. So yep. when you do that rotating thing, are those big enough to go to the on the outside ring of the dish? So no, and and there's a there's a, again a centripetal force that kind of pulls these back in, and so at the low speeds they can be across the whole dish. As you speed them up, they wind up confined in the inner roughly third of the diameter, and and we've seen that across multiple ones, independent of, of the size range we've looked at uh, and other parameters. You could change, we haven't changed viscosity of the media and that sort of thing. It's another way you could fine tune that a bit more. Is the rotary cell culture a surrogate for the circulatory system in the embryo? So at these stages, there is no circulatory system. <laughs> You, you are a mass of cells bathed in uh, um, amniotic fluid. Well, I mean the amniotic fluid. You've got a, a sheeting around, a coating around that. So why are we uh, taking 65 RPMs? That's 
quite a lot of rotation among the galaxies. Even for, for, for gravity, it's lesser than that. So the, the practical reason this one was that we could create two different environments where hydrodynamic environments are different and maintain those other properties. 65 is as high as you can go in the system before you start throwing media over the walls. So that was, a, that was part of the, the reason why, at least from a thought that it wasn't best practices cell culture wise. Um, and, 40, and going lower, the, the, the particular instrument we use doesn't, it can start to, the stability is bad. And we've actually done some engineering-y kind of things to remove electronics, pull them out and stuff like that so we can maintain these. These are calibrated regularly, that sort of thing. But there's some, very, there can be variability due to that. So the question I, I brought up, I mentioned this, um, so I'm glad I mentioned and didn't think to link the two. Non-physiological but controlled can help enable you to ask some of these questions. Um, I could make up and wildly speculate some things. At uh, the conference I mentioned, someone asked this question when Lance and I were just that. And um, you know, when one thing came out and we were trying to think about this, you know, um, and was, did you ask me that? Was it? Well, no, I, I think. I mean, basically, there are uh, there are membranes surrounding the embryo that are uh, basically there to hold the. joked the other day that one of the things that when it came out there was a little, you know, they do a little uh, release thing and then it gets picked up. One of them was something about shaking baby syndrome or something like that. Like, that was not what we were trying to look at, but, you know, you try to speculate on what it might be and, and one question came up, you know, bed rest versus activity and things like that. But again, this is still pretty far removed from a true developmental system. But it enabled us to probe some things and control it, ha have better control over what we're doing with the system and do population analysis than we could otherwise. One, one sec, sorry, she did. So do you think uh, the differences between the amniotic fluid viscosity and, you know, your media chain, your media mm. has an effect, and your shaking will create a kind of shear that will maybe caused by the amniotic fluid? Well, as Lynn said, there's a, even that, there's there's membranes that separate some of those from it. So you're, you're bathed in it, but there's a, a, a there's still another transport layer across that. So, um, it can't say no, <laughs> but I don't think it's exactly or directly anecdotally related to that. But but I can't I can't rule it out. <laughs> so is the membrane oh. basically over that that embryo body, or so we so it sort of creates its own sort of membrane-like structure, but still not exactly like the one that's in development. But again, cells in these in these subjected to physical environments, how they adapt to it. And so the cells on the outside with this transport, but even without the transport, that we get cells in the layer that form a different structure and they're static, it's just hard to keep them apart. But you can see some similarities. It's more uniform and then the question is, does that constant physical uh, cue that's surrounding them, does it do something to change that layer on the outside? Um, a naive question, would it be easier to just do a linear flow? So um, linear flow with a suspended object, what do you think happens? <laughs> We can pin it down like a boom, right? Ah, so now you've added another one. You're going you're gonna to impale <laughs> these aggregates, right? I'm not saying not. I'm just saying think, as we think through and we've thought of some of these, one of the challenges is, yeah, it would be easier. It would be more uniform, more constant, all that. Um, but how much of a change are we making in the system? That's, that could be a major change that is going to completely change the context of what it is. So in this case where we're trying to n not perturb the structure largely and see what's kind of happening, it's difficult to do. I, I can show you one though. We, we, we have come up with one way to hold things in place and subject them to motion. So I'll, I'll, I'll show that picture at least before we finish. There is a change in expression level of different genes. So uh, these changes are reversible or irreversible and ah. they are reversible to how much extent? Yeah, great question. So um, the, the, the loss of the pluripotency, that first part of it, Generally speaking, in these in vitro systems, with just culture, with uh, changing media and other factors, those are irreversible. Once the cells adopt it, they generally don't go back to that pluripotent state. Um, what I said at the beginning, though, is that there are certain stresses that you can get cells, we know, to revert all the way back. Currently, you have to use genetic means and other things. But 
All of that occurs, and what happens in the reprogramming is an epigenetic event. So even though in do, uh, exogenous genes are placed in the cells, those get silenced, and it's the, actually the, the endogenous genome that gets turned back on. So what that suggested to me, and the powerful part of that, is that actually it could be possible, we just don't know how yet, that environmental changes could get a cell to revert back and reactivate that machinery because it's embedded. You don't lose it in the genome. It gets silenced through epigenetic means, meaning that there are genes and th methylation events and other things that occur that turn those off permanently. The changes, like for these pluripotent ones, oftentimes the, what they look for is, do you see methylation patterns occur on OX4 and ANOG and SOX2? And so they get silenced. Well, not SOX2, because sometimes SOX2 is on another ones, but OX4 and ANOG are two of the main ones that are associated with that early undifferentiated phenotype. And if you see permanent silencing, then you'd never really see it come back on, especially in in vitro types of settings. And even during the development, there's very few cells, tissues in the body that retain expression, high level expression of those genes. Sort of related to that, in your system, did you look at the epigenetic landscape of your cells to see if and how it changed? So we are looking, <laughs> is what I can say. We have done one series we just, uh, published this past year. We're actually working with an epigenetic knockout. So in this case, this is a H1 class of, so these are the linker histones, which is really interesting because they're responsible for compaction at the, at the first level. So you have the nucleosome wrapping and everything is extended out. But if you, the H1 serve the role to compact that down, which is necessary for subsequent differentiation. If you knock out, you need to knock out three isoforms at once. It's embryonic lethal very early. Um, they don't, there's no gas relation, there's no nothing. Um, if we have those cell lines with this collaborator, we can go through and actually you, you in, uh, impair differentiation quite a bit. It will still sort of occur in some of it, but there's compensatory mechanisms plus you're now in an in vitro system. So there's other stresses that may, uh, the other classes of those uh, H1 linkers. But what we're interested in is exactly that. We're making environmental changes and the, the motivation is, I, I use it as nature versus nurture. So nurture is what we're putting into these, and that's where the epigenetic, your nature is your genome, whatever it is, that stays constant, but what we're seeing is differences. And so we're very interested actually in looking at the epigenetic level. The question then becomes, which level do you look at? So you can look at one specific gene, or you can look at the whole methylation pattern. You can do that across multiple different conditions. Um, it's uh, an expensive and a time intensive kind of thing, but it doesn't mean you, can't, you shouldn't do it. Um, part of what we've done is to really try to focus on what are some of the interesting phenotypes so we have a well-controlled system where that would then be really important to go back and do. Um, and there's another one where we, we serve more of a um, assistance sort of purpose where someone is looking at, at, at the next level of epigenetics. And that is, after you have it compacted, then it forms these, these coil things and there's, there's proteins there. And in some work that has been, I know, recently submitted and is, is out on a review right now, uh, from some folks over at Emory along with uh, a, a number of other collaborators. They're actually looking at that whole interactome and how the epigenetics and what's going on there. So we're, we're very interested, but we're uh, very naive at this point, I think, about it. Peter. Yeah, just curious, is anybody, you know, have done the work to screen the whole, you know, genome epigenetic patterns under a different mechanical environment? No, no, not in a mechanical environment, no. No, it's, it's, so one of the things with this is that a lot of those are done with um, somewhat standardized assays. Most often uh, the epigenetic stuff has been done, a lot of it's been done on the reprogramming side of things, where it goes from some somatic cell back to the uh, undifferentiated or pluripotent phenotype. Um, and there's, there's increasing amounts, but not as much in the overall literature about differentiation in the epigenetic. There are some, there is some, but not as much. And one of the reasons could be is that uh, Lab X's protocol slightly differs from mine, so our results are going to, I think, differ as well. But we haven't done that yet. But if we could have a couple of these with different differentiation ones, and perhaps we do different mechanical, same soluble, same a different soluble, same mechanical, we could actually ask questions about it and get at what are the effects of these environmental types of things, and how does it manifest at that epigenetic level? So, yeah, these are things we're very, very interested in trying to explore. So. Um, once grant reviewers, I guess, agree with us, then, we, then we'll then we be able to rapidly accelerate with that. But that's, sort, that's one of the directions we want to head with this, absolutely. Yeah? Um, in all these experiments we are looking at, for example, expression of some markers like at D7, so how does this uh, like time scale compare to what actually happens in physiological conditions? So uh, the earlier on, it's actually, it's pretty similar and with mouse ones, but over time then it, it, it's lost is what I would say. So, and, and it goes both ways. In human development, that's a nine month period and the rest of it. But you can see the formation of 
cardiomyocytes or in 10 to 12 days at some points. That's much earlier than an embryonic development. But the, the two scenarios, if we go back, very different uh, developmental ones. And, and again, that rapid progression that we can, you may see with the human ones that would accelerate past what you'd see in human development, you know, it's not the same well-controlled system. And there's reasons for it. You, know, you don't necessarily want the heart muscle cells appearing until there's other elements of that system. Um, so it's, it's just not as well refined, I would say. So, um, so following that question, is it, is it possible that, um, for example, a cell conditions to uh, induce, for example, stem cells to express early markers, uh, that cell condition is not relevant to the further development of uh, like cells? It's, it's very possible. As I was saying, like, we don't know. And from a practical side, if it enhances efficiency and you have a, a target cell population, do you, do you care that it's development, that it didn't do, use the same mechanism as development? And the other part could be we don't know all the mechanisms development has at work. We're still, there's a lot of, of that is still being explored. A lot of it is oftentimes developmentally inspired. So BMP4s and the other ones, they know that uh, the cells express receptor, receptors for these. They express the molecules themselves and, and wince as well. There's a relatively small class of really potent morphogenic factors that it, it influence the patterning of all of the different uh, cells and tissues. It's just how they're used, when they're used, and what combinations they're used. And that's just the soluble side. There's the other, there's physical forces and other things. There's matrix, which I have, I've touched on this. Also, that's all involved in the system at once. Good questions. All right, let me, I'm gonna jump a couple so it, you can close your eyes and then I'll, I'll flip them back. But I wanna go to two other quick things so we can discuss. So I'm gonna go through this. There's mechanical, I'm gonna skip this, not because of, of this. I think that actually the example, see if the next speaker will give you even better ones. But one of the things we're interested in is, you know, how can you start to measure physical changes in the system? And what I'll say is we're trying to do this and we see some differences over time and with different conditions. So I'm not hiding anything, I just wanna go quick with this. This is the squisher. The other thing I'll just mention as a note, and I don't know if, if they're talking about any kind of partial least squares regression or PCA in the, okay. So I just want to introduce an idea to this that, to think about. Maybe some of you already thought about this. And that is as you collect larger and larger data sets, not just of one type of characterization, so gene expression, but as you're doing maybe physical types of characterization of this or other types of characterization, you can start to acquire large data sets. And you can look at these over time. The question is, is how do you present this information? How do you extract information from it? What really matters and what relates to what? So this is a correlation type of thing. So remember, correlation, not causality here that you can start to look at different parameters across different axes. And I, this is not my expertise, but working with people now from this, and actually uh, the two folks I work with at faculty at Georgia Tech are both uh, trainees of Doug Laufenberger here at MIT, uh, so I trust them quite a bit. <laughs> um, so Manu Plot is one, and Melissa Kemp, who actually was co-author on the work I showed with all of the gene expression stuff, uh, and has been a friend since graduate school days, um, when we were same graduate program together, uh, has worked with us on this. And so here we have, in this case, differentiation BMP4 treatment as our two experimental parameters. And then we're looking at it, we start to plot out individual gene expression across this 2D type of landscape. And we're also overlaying some of the mechanical parameters that we are extracting or, or values from this. And interestingly, you just see that things sort of pop in different clusters. And there's ways to associate the relative quantitative uh, strength of that association just based on how close they are to one another. But again, you have to always be careful because you want to think that, oh, that's related to that and then go to experiment. It may not be the case. It could be somewhat coincidental. But there's interesting things from this and it's a way to, I just want to throw it out there to think about and look at when you start to think of your experiments that not everything is linear. This is a way to look at non-linear types of relationships. And so if I go to this about the transport, I want to show you just one thing. I'll show you two things with this so we can discuss them. One is, Everything is, I've said so far, is how do you try to control from the outside in? How do you control from the inside out? The reason for this for us is that there are structural changes, and this is more the typical embryo body that we've seen that has this out, sort of outer cell layer that forms its own sort of membrane, and then all the other stuff inside, cells and matrix that accumulates. And the functional result is that if you actually add soluble chemicals, even small hydrophobic molecules, which can readily permeate into the cells, that largely at the, you see them at the surface like you would in monolayer, all the cells are labeled, but as you go down a couple of layers into this 3D structure optically, you see that they're only on the outside. And I don't have the cross uh, or the counter stain here, but there are cells all throughout. It's not a hollow ball at this point. So how do you control inside? Well, one of the ways we proposed to do this several years ago is if you put small B 
beads or microparticles in this case. There's a whole bunch of engineering you could do with those microparticles. And they could be nano, they could be other things. The reason we chose micro is these are sort of serving as local depots and, and not surrogate cells, but things that are on the order of magnitude of the cell. So they can't take, these cells can't take up a pro, uh, object as large or larger than itself. So they're gonna stay trapped in the interstitial space. That was the initial hypothesis. And I'll say that that's what we've demonstrated. So I'll just, to skip these, say we've done this with different materials. We've been able to demonstrate we can get them entrapped uh, and that they can release cargo or present cargo in this context. This is with some PLJ from the first papers that came out with this. This is just an example. This is one of the morphogenic examples that was very intriguing. If you deliver retinoic acid, the first thing you see is that in this population we see a very different phenotype uh, at the histological level. We didn't know what this was for quite some period of time. We did gene expression, whole genome expression, not the smaller arrays. This clarified the answer because actually there were specific genes that came up that we wouldn't have anticipated initially based on the published literature for what the role would be. And we did additional characterization. So in this case, this is all with standing for where the proteins are, not the mRNA, but we could do that as well. And you start to see where your cell populations exist. And the result of this is that we have something that structurally resembles a mouse E6.75 blastocyst. So one of the questions, what do you do with this? I've been asked, you know, do you implant these? We haven't tried that. <laughs> um, I don't know that they would develop normally. A lot of times the cells in vitro to these, they've been exposed to a lot of stuff. They, they probably wouldn't. But structurally, you've got something now that you've got elements of developmental biology that are occurring reproducibly in a dish. You could think about questions you could, you could start to look at with that. And that's one of the things we've been interested in. So let me do this. All I'm going to say is that we've done this for a bunch of different molecules and morphogens and different materials and those things have effects. But, let me do this one. To get at this question of what, you know, what are, where are we working towards? There's spatial heterogeneity, as I mentioned, during development as one thing. And so one of the things is oftentimes we have heterogeneity, but can we control it to ask questions? There we had one simple cue and we got heterogeneity in terms of the organization of the layer, but uniform throughout. So in this case, one of the things is, you know, you've got close concentrations of different growth factors that are in different or, uh, geometries relative to one another that are responsible for patterning. So one of the things we did was rather, rather simple. <laughs> One of the things we did was rather simple is we actually changed the particle, in this case, paramagnetic particles. And what we could then do is but if we apply an external magnet, then we could, the thought was we could move these things around. So maybe that's why it's showing it. There we go. So that's what you get. <laughs> so if you have these now and we have a small number of magnetic particles that have been physically incorporated, they're big enough, they're not inside the cells, you apply a magnet, you can move them all across the field. One of the things that brought up the question, if you actually apply an external magnet and you shake the dish, you, they stay in the, magnet, the regions where the magnetic is. So one way you could do that is actually to hold them in place and expose them to things. It does require a much more uh, complicated sort of where, how you apply the magnetic field than what we did grossly. So we haven't done it that, at that level of resolution, but it should be entirely possible. And that was actually one of the questions we had had was how can we hold these things in place without physically changing the structure too much? And the, the particle incorporation can, is one way to do that. The other thing you can do with this is then you can move things around, you can make patterns of things. If you dump in different populations here, just use a different cell tracker to identify different groups. You can start to align them and do, and this is all sorted by hand. Again, you can envision better ways to control this. Uh, but one of the reasons we're interested in is this, and that is that if you take them at early time points, and I had said before, agglomeration is a problem, but if you actually take them and use controlled agglomeration, then the ECAT here and they'll fuse, but you actually still get largely the retention of the hemisphere where they were. So there's a little bit of mixing, but not a lot. And so the idea we want to do with this, and the example shown here again, a by hand example, is you can actually start to take the individual aggregates, align them to one another, and the respective geometry or shape they adopt is that which with you can engineer or design. And if you then start to think about putting in specific cues into each of these first, now it might be some way you could start to actually ask questions about this. Without genetically manipulating the cells, being able to control exactly, pretty precisely, what you put into those environments in the first place. So that's one thing that we're very interested in. And then the other thing I just wanted to show as an example, I can just skip to it, is there's still all these problems. There's transport uh, image challenges associated with these. We're working on the particles, address some of it. <coughs> Imaging it is a problem. Doing all this in real time, everything I've shown you is fixed samples. And this non-destructive methods, everything I do, we, we oftentimes section, cut, 
lice, you know, that's how we get our information. So it's kind of a, you know, if you were to want to do this for actual practical purposes in QC, you'd like to come up with ways to not do that. <laughs> um, and one thing this brings up, using a couple slides from Peter, is that this is a really, I think, powerful system, a very, uh, a system in need, I would say, of this, where there is computational modeling tools, and there's certain early design principles where you only, we only have a little bit of information, but with a, some, a certain assumptions to start, we can start to maybe use computation as a way to probe through some of this space and come up with and, and perhaps uh, refine some of the hypotheses that are out there. My guess too is you'll disprove some things. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna upset some people, but you know that's the fun part of what we get to do. So and then there's also these various levels of things that are hard to measure in the systems themselves or do in this monitoring way that you could also do in a, in a computational sense. <coughs> so there are a couple different types of ways to model. You can model the single cell. There's all the stuff that's going on inside and the gene regulation transduction. This oftentimes will use these series of differential equations. You can have different logic circuits involved. Not my strength, but I just, just want to put it up there to, to give you a sense. But there's also the population level, and that is that each of these units operating on those basis of those particular rules or constraints also has the fact that there are changes that are occurring, but there's also the spatial temporal organization that is occurring across the populations. So it operates on some of these, but there's a number of other types of things. And I'll just highlight one, which is agent-based models, where you set a bunch of rules, you control in a system, and see what kind of happens. This gets us back again to the emergence. So we've done one of these. I'll show you one example. It was just submitted this week for, we'll see how it does. So we looked at this and started by measuring parameters such as the size of our cells. And this was something we do with Easy Coulter Counter. We can then actually seed these cells. Now we've seeded them virtually. We've taken them and created a population of cells of the normal size. And just like we said, okay, well we have 500 or 1,000 cells. We're gonna take 1,000, put them into this space, and we're gonna force them to aggregate using physics-based algorithms. You can then get aggregates. These aggregates will form with some st stochasticity to associate with them. So each one doesn't exactly the same depending on when you set this up. And you also have interconnections. So you can look at the network between these cells and how connected they are or not, or the relative spatial distance of each individual unit to all of the others in that aggregate. And then we go back to the aggregates and actually measure. In this case, this is the early aggregates. And so the, there's some immunos immunostaining here, both for the cell nuclei as well as OCT4. And you can get measures of how much, apart, how close or similar they are. And then using these, we can start to validate elements of the model physically. And all I can say here is that, again, lack of statistical significance that we saw is because that the, the, uh, without much, you know, without, with only taking this into account and the physics forces, we can start to actually get this. So we didn't have to sit there a long time and go back and forth and back and forth and make it match. That wasn't the, we actually did this before we went back and did the measures of the, of the actual system. Because when we got these, we started to then think about what do we actually need to measure to validate this. So this worked out pretty well, but with a good student, good collaborators, things tend to work themselves out like that. What's interesting then is then we started with a very simple rule system. And the rule system here is that this could be entirely random, that the undifferentiated cell just under some period of time, you put in some stochastic level of noise and, you know, it happens. Okay, maybe, but with everything else I showed you, you can probably tell that's not necessarily what we thought would happen. So if you also include a positive feedback that that might happen first or at some point, but once a differentiated cell appears, the propensity for a neighboring cell to, be, to differentiate might be increased. Now, why that is could be a number of things, but we're just using a spatial localization kind of thing, so very simple. So there could be multiple reasons why, but we're just kind of lumping them all together and saying if that event happens, then this event is more likely to happen. But there's also the case that the system might want to fight back against itself, and that could be that if this happens but there's an undifferentiated cell, it might also want to be relatively pulling back and saying, no, don't differentiate yet, to avoid this from being a spontaneous event. So we model all of these, and this again gets into like new types of ways of visualizing, new ways to try and quantify these types of things. And what I can say is that there's different trajectories. We use this, these parameters, differentiated cluster number, undifferentiated cluster number, and then this is normalized time. And normalized time meaning that we haven't applied it to a fixed length scale. There's an iteration over which this can run, and we could then use that to, to control the time period we're looking at. But we're still starting to get what are the true kinetics. So we're doing measures of what the undifferentiated and the differentiated population is. And it's over the course of about seven days under most of these studies where we see complete loss of the pluripotent expression. And so that's what's modeled here is that you have random patterns where just sort of uh, starting with undifferentiated, you see that the blue is the acquisition of it over time, but there's always some persistence of these little cells of OCT4 that are still there. Um, 
in this case, and sorry, this one here is only at uh, like 60% of it. So you're not getting, we're not showing you all the way to the blue, full blue. We're showing you the middle period of this. Um, in this case, when it starts off that you know, after some period of time, it's still largely undifferentiated. You get these little patterns and things occur and then it just kind of peters out over time. This is the positive feedback rule. But the one that was interesting, and you see the most distinct difference, the trajectory has changed on this. It's sort of flipped up and over in a different way. And not shown here, but what I can tell you is that the one where we see patterns that look most closely like this is when we apply this set of rules. So this is giving us a sense then that, you know, now we can go in and think about what molecules play these roles and what is actually going on in the system that could be actually having, uh, enabling this to occur. And then go back again into our experimental system and look at this more closely. I, I, I warn my students I get most excited by that which I know least. I'm very excited about this, so that tells you again some of the things in terms of everything that's going on behind it, but I see this as being extremely powerful for, I think, coupling with it. And I just wanted to end with that because I think that it's something that I'm sure there'll be other elements. Some of you have computational background. I have little to none. The last time I did C programming was as an undergraduate and it was not one of my stronger courses. Um, that being said, it has been really fun to work on this and to really understand this and learn through these processes. Um, and I think that this is really quite powerful. So even an experimentalist, you come to a lab and think, oh, we're gonna do experiments and all that kind of stuff. Be careful because they may just want to, you know, go back more to that modeling or, or computational side. I'm sure it goes both ways in terms of whatever your backgrounds are. So I just wanna end there. Uh, I talked about this global local. I wanna acknowledge the, the folks in the group. Um, I don't have time to go through all, but I, I do want to highlight Melissa Kinney, who's situated here. Um, outsta absolutely outstanding student. You could probably tell because the number of slides I showed that had Kinney somewhere on that. She has been involved in so many different things, and she is just a, an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, student, uh, BU graduate, uh, one of the best ones I've, best uh, graduate students I've had. Um, and then also numbers of collaborators through this, and this list has continued to grow, and actually one of the ones that now it's starting to grow is with this the EBEX group in here as well, so with one of the, the CBET award that we have. So I left a little bit of time still for questions. I'm glad we had some during it, but I definitely want to take some more if you guys have more to ask. So. Have you ever tried these experiments on adult stem cells? Yep. So they, the. The outcomes are going to be different because of the inherent uh, potency or plasticity of the cells. So we have a series of studies we've done with mesenchymal stem cells. And interestingly, uh, 3D spheroid is not a conventional way, with the exception of trying to uh, promote chondrogenesis. And people think, oh yeah, they do these suspension ones. But the chondrogenesis assay they do with mesenchymal is 200,000 cells per aggregate. It's a macroscopic thing. And the reason they do it is it's sort of, I, I would say, just a poor man's way of inducing a hypoxic environment. You put a whole bunch of cells into a mask <laughs> and it's hypoxic and that's known to promote chondrogenesis. Um, and you can do large ones like in 15 mil tubes and you can do a bunch of those. Um, we've done these and actually things we see is that we see more almost uh, less gene, gene expression drift in the cells, so one thing with, with MSCs in particular, they're good for a certain number of passages and then they sort of peter out, their differentiation potential is less, they quiesce um, under, under, in serum containing media. Um, we don't see those kinds of changes as spheroids, but we also don't see exp a lot of growth. What we see is largely quiescence, <coughs> more so. So, but quiescence, but they can still grow, not, not like permanent quiescence where they, they lose the, or senesce, the senesce is the term. They senesce typically the ones we see quiescence in ours. So, I think there are principles of that that are, you know, we can take the same approaches or tools and try them in, in another scenario and see different things because you've changed the context. And so everything that's known 